So what disc are we on? 62. All right. Tellerico. <laughs> Plus, don't forget to check out all the cool moves, downloads, and demos in the vault. Okay, so this is Demo Disc Theater. I don't know what episode I'm on, but I'm on uh, official U.S. PlayStation Magazine Demo Disc number 62. PlayStation 2 disc, and these PlayStation 2 discs tend to have a, a lot of content. So much content that I've always had to sp uh, split these episodes up into two separate episodes because holy shit it's a lot of content <laughs> so i'm going to start this like i always start and go through the demos does that run like hell What the hell's balls anyway? Is that some kind of a drink? Too bad you picked the wrong side. Run like hell. I cannot recall. It's not too many games that I was crazy excited about after seeing them unveiled. And then was so, so disappointed with what ended up coming out. It felt like... I don't, I don't think there was a demo. There was a demo of Run Like Hell that eventually came out. RHL, they ended up calling it. And it was... So, Run Like Hell was supposed to be a survival horror game set in a space station where there was a lot of um, survival gameplay things that you would see more nowadays, like weapon and ammo crafting. And the enemies were supposed to be, like, super tough... And all that kind of stuff. And the game that they ended up coming out with didn't look nearly as good as what was originally shown off. There, it became more of just like I don't know. It was it was the game was a lot easier than I was expecting it to be, and it had no atmosphere to it. And it just I expected Silent Hill in space, and I got just like it. A run and gun game like the enemies were like that i don't i don't remember there being ammo or weapon crafting in it and just the enemies were there too many enemies they like they ramped down the whatever we're not playing that game why am i talking about it wild arms three should have read those instructions i didn't bother Almost Western style uh, music to it. Walk away from the camera a little bit. Uh, this looks like there's three different options that we have to choose here. Um, I've never. Well, I mean, I must have played Wild Arms at some point if I have the demo disc. But I don't remember Wild Arms really at all.
little late for that. Guy's not doing a very good job of controlling the situation. Bit of a funny of like a funny post processing filter they have over everything. Where some textures have this kind of graininess to them. Oh, it's not really in the texture, it's just an over uh, filter laid over top of everything. Go gun him down. All right. Condition green.
Oh, just the switch. <laughs> Oh, I guess I didn't know you were coming. <laughs> oh, this room got real big. <laughs> oh, can I control her movement? No, no, I can't. Not really. If you had guns, why'd you let them get away with this shit to begin with? Uh, okay. So we got a JRPG here. Yeah, yeah, I'll figure it out. Who cares? <laughs> so we have a JRPG here, and one that I guess is a... Oh, I can sneak. Look at that. It's the kind of thing I don't really think of a whole lot as being the... Um, something that was common in the PlayStation 2 era, which was games that didn't have voice acting. Seems kind of strange to think about. I mean, I guess I really didn't play all that many RPGs back in the PS2 era. A few of them, of course. But not nearly as many as sort of like what I consider the... <laughs> okay. Kind of the golden age of the, R the JRPG anyway, which was the PlayStation 1 era. Highly flammable crest. Want that tomato? <laughs> Whatever. But it's kind of think like okay, so the the PlayStation Two. Really, like, the DVD drive and all that kind of stuff. It really opened up the possibility for having voice acting in longer games. More audio, that kind of stuff. Whereas PlayStation 1 CDs, you know, was a lot more storage than the console was. But, but not really enough to have every single game have a lot of voice acting. You had, like, Resident Evil and stuff that had voice acting. But really, there wasn't a whole hell of a lot of it in the game. But, uh, DVD really opened up that possibility. Plus, like, more memory and stuff in the console itself. But I guess not every game. It's not practical for every game to have that much. Because, like, there's added cost with not only hiring the voice actors, but editing their performances and engineering the game to be capable of having it. Finally, another fight. What the fuck? Gundam down. Right, I'm not going to spend much more time on this. Not gonna be spending much more time on this game because uh, I got a whole demo disc to get through. Yay!
<laughs> they say L2 or R2. Kind of goofy. <laughs> Can't really have much to say about the story going on right now. But, uh... I mean, it's got one. <laughs> I mean, we're still in the intro. Duplicator. It already told you what it was. <laughs> oh, backstory time. You're like shooting arms. <laughs> some John Woo shit. Why do they call them arms instead of guns? Right half of something. Oh, yay. You saved the game. Is it possible for me to save in a... Possible for me to save in this demo? Well, anyway, let's, uh, let's hop out of this demo. Sly Cooper! Okay. I've mentioned it before. Sucker Punch, huh? I've mentioned it before, but I feel like, although the in the previous generation, it was the N64 where you went to if you wanted good platformers. I have repeatedly said that the PlayStation 2, in its respective generation, is where you wanted to go if you wanted to find good platformer games. And Sly Cooper is an example of why the PS2 was so good with these. A lot of the limitations that made the PS1 not a fantastic platformer uh, game, a console for platformer games, the PlayStation 2 just fixed all of it. I mean, there was a dual analog control, which was the uh, which was better for platforming games than what the GameCube had. God, you know, I, I do not understand. Here's where we break out that new climb move we got from the Panda King section of the Phoebeus Raccoonus. Okay, but remember, <laughs> you can only climb As you know. certain objects, like pipes and ropes. Yeah, sure, and like that ladder there? That is correct, but do not forget, Sly. You have to get close. Then hit the circle button to grab it. Yeah, 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 relax, Bentley. I live for this stuff. Yeah, and that's what worries me. <laughs> I don't understand what it is that people like about the GameCube controller. Like, it's it's slightly oddly shaped. It is just kind of goofy, and the, the right analog stick has this kind of... See those searchlights? One careless step and you'll be subjected to acute combustion. Not only that, I'm picking up significant activity on my thermal scanner. The place is crawling with Raleigh's thugs. Factoring all risks, I'd advise you to scrub this mission immediately. You done whining? Let's go. 
the the sort of right analog stick has this octagonal kind of uh, circle to it, and the what is it? The, um, the bumpers are. Oh, I can't go through there. I got myself killed, idiot. <laughs> and the bumpers, uh, the shoulder buttons are just not uh, unevenly. They're unevenly placed. I don't just don't like it. Anyway, well, anyway, the, those are the things that contributed to the GameCube not really being that great for platformers. There was like Mario Sunshine and stuff like that, but Sony really put an effort in with Sly Cooper and with um, Jack and Daxter and all of that. Oh. God, I'm bad at this. <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, Sucker Punch. That's one of the more prominent studios now. I'm trying to remember what the hell it is that they've done more recently, though. Messages in a bottle. I'm not going to bother collecting those. These demo discs tend to be so long. <laughs> These demo discs tend to be so long, I don't want to spend a lot of time on any one particular demo. So I might not even finish this one. <laughs> I like this art style. I guess you'd call this cell shaded nowadays, wouldn't you? Just a kind of an appearance of a cartoon drawing. Ah, shit. <laughs> Just whip the key into the door. <laughs> See, look at that. This just this large. Uh, wide spanning environment just you couldn't do this on the PlayStation 1 the PlayStation or the uh, the N64 was better suited for this kind of thing large environments but there's way more detail way more stuff in this than the N64 could have done of course the GameCube wouldn't have any trouble the GameCube was in a, in a whole lot of ways a lot more powerful than the PlayStation 2 was oops But just, I can't get over the controller. <laughs> and the, uh... Plus, Nintendo just didn't put the effort into it that Sony did. Okay, so... Moving on. DDR Max Dance Dance Revolution. Right, left... I've played DDR, tried it in an arcade. This doesn't really work without the dance pad. Let's but we have to do this the with a controller. This is going to be terrible. Toward the full combo. 
This is definitely the genre of game that, like, Guitar Hero was developed from. There's no joy in playing this without some kind of better controller for it. Oh, God. Terrible. <laughs> That's enough of that. <laughs> Dual hearts. I don't know what this is. Look at Tumble. Another first party game. Or second party. I don't know who Atlas is. The Sony published it. It's got to be a Sony IP, isn't it? Well, I guess not always. Sony has a lot of different IPs that they've created over the years. It's actually kind of weird... I think that Sony has probably as many IPs as Nintendo does, as far as like game series and stuff they've created. Just most of them, just nobody remembers. Like I don't even know what the hell I'm playing here. Wow, this is an ugly game. <laughs> uh, God damn, what the hell is this garbage? <laughs> How do I get off this weird Pikachu thing? There we go. I have some camera control, but not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Talking to Yuri? You dreaming while awake? It's weird daydreams. It's like an Alundra kind of thing.
Sheep. A lot of screen tearing. Throw your rock. Okay, let's try again. I guess I gotta time it better. Nope. <laughs> Come on. Did I have to do a charge attack? Yes, I did. Try it with the other weapon. There we go. something with it. We've got a first person view here. Oh my god. <laughs> a lot of weird shit. Oh, really? That's what I got to do? Oh my god, this is a tedious mess. <laughs> Oh, you got a lot smaller. Alright, that was easy. What do I do with you? <laughs> I'd have had enough of this. <laughs> this is not very good. Motorcross. It was the PlayStation 1 era. Oh, I mean, I guess it really always was a kind of an, a thing like this, but... It was during the PlayStation 1 era that you saw an explosion of these kind of... Ooh, Renderware. It's an old game engine. An explosion of these smaller budget titles that were made for niche markets. As popular as motocross may seem to motocross fans, it's not a thing with a whole lot of mass appeal to it. So you've... But the PlayStation 1 era, you started to see games made for these smaller markets. Some of them exploded into the larger markets, like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Other ones like um, Motocross, I, I guess mostly just stuck around with their own um, their own market. But the PlayStation 1, it became cheap enough to develop games for that console and release games on that console 
that these smaller markets could have their have their niche. PlayStation 2, I don't know, it feels like you started to see these kinds of things fall off. There weren't so many of these kinds of games being released later on in the PS2 life cycle, and I guess PlayStation 3, you know, indie games or the smaller releases, not like full-on, full-budget games nowadays would be where you'd find this kind of stuff. It's not like... Um, Anybody's making a motocross game with the kind of budget or care or attention to detail that you'd see in a FIFA game or Madden or um, MLB game or anything like that. It does seem like they put a fair bit of effort into this, though. I mean, it's it doesn't look like a fantastic PS2 game, but it doesn't look bad either, does it? Oh, some guy just wiped out. <laughs> Keep going. I guess uh, the fact that this used a... Uh, that this used a middleware engine, so it used renderware. Play 7. <laughs> Is he flipping us off? He flipped us off. You started to see a, a big explosion of middleware tools being used for a lot of games. So in the, in the um, older generations, you tended to have games coded, like the game itself is coded into the into the software. So it's like, oh well, this is the level. You may have had tools to help you develop those levels and all that kind of stuff, but you kind of needed to, to encode, place items around and all that kind of stuff. Game mechanics, that kind of stuff. PlayStation 1 area still saw a fair bit of that. In the PS2 area started to see a um, real like proliferation of these tools like Renderware, which eased development made it easier so you had these sort of unified tools you could use across different platforms and they made developing things easier and I guess that's how things like that motocross game were still able to come out on the PlayStation 2 even though you'd think it wouldn't have um, enough market to market appeal to put that much development time into Red Faction 2 admit that I don't play a lot of Red Faction 2 Red Faction 1 was the game that I was a big fan of. The gimmick of Red Faction was that was environmental destruction. And uh, let's take a look how it works in this game. You would have like a grenade or something and you throw it and you blow a hole in the wall. And it was actually used. It was that. God, this does not control like a modern game. What the fuck? Look at that. Environmental destruction. Although it's not, it's not as big of a deal in this as I'm seeing it would have been in Red Faction 1. I'm not blowing holes in the wall or anything, I'm just wrecking these columns. Light rounds picked up. Dual wielding! Let's take a look here. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's not quite as detailed. Oh, each button left and right. <laughs> okay. Unhealthy situation here. Did you say that? <laughs> Come on, I want to blow holes in the wall. Red Faction, as well as Time Splitters and all that, were kind of different takes on what console first-person shooters could or should be prior to, like, Halo or Call of Duty coming around and sort of setting the standard. Not to say any of them were bad or anything like that. It was just... It just wasn't until later that people really knew what a console first-person shooter could end up being. PC FPSs were already there, I think, but... So we're in kind of like a bit of an awkward time. before the Halo and Call of Duty model really came in and revolutionized what console FPSs were. And I'm dead. <laughs> Dr. Muto? I don't know what this is. I don't know, it feels like Red Faction 2 was kind of missing the one thing that made Red Faction 1 so unique, which was, like, the destructor and destructible environments weren't just a gimmick. It was implemented into the gameplay pretty uniquely, Welcome like... Welcome to Toltec. It is burnt There's a hole, there's a, there's a door you can't get through. Ten Terra and... It's a hole you can't get through. What do you do? Well, you find some explosives and you put a hole in the wall. Huh. A lot of detail in that character model. Look at this guy. Alert. I'm detecting a terror piece nearby. The right hand lock controls the camera. Pressing it toggles first person mode. R2 snaps the camera behind you. Use the triangle button to morph into the mouse, Doctor. To get the Terra, use the X to jump. X again to double jump. And hold the X down when double jumping to hover. This is so weird. <laughs> this is a map of the facility grounds. The red dot is your current. An access key to the junkyard is hidden inside the pump station. Alert. I'm detecting a terror piece nearby. Ah, mouse trap. I do not recommend that, Doctor. I warned you. <laughs> this is a weird game. Mad scientist. Ah, the more things I can power. <laughs> Use the oh. pistons to jump higher. Uh, 
All right, so I gotta time it, I guess. There we go. <laughs> I do not remember this at all. Oh! There we go. Yes, the key for the junkyard door. I could use that. I could use that. <laughs> If only I had a mustache, I could twirl. <laughs> Danger. Bugs detected. Use the circle button to attack them. <laughs> Bugs detected. Stand here to use the catapult, Doctor. Come on. Thanks. That was so helpful. <laughs> Why the bug's so much bigger than a mouse? Hammer's fighting me. I want to be able to see in this direction. to the junkyard is at the end of this air vent. Warning. Warning, I guess the air vent? <laughs> Whee! A piece of terror! Only nine more to find! Now I'm dead. <laughs> Do I gotta start that whole thing over again? Jeez. Alright. Getting out. <laughs> now it seems like an interesting game. Like something that somebody put a lot of effort into. Just it's weird that no one seems to... Well, I don't remember it at least. Hitman 2. I was never a big fan of the Hitman games. It just wasn't something that interested me. I've played them before. Obviously, at least I played this demo. But, I uh, um... Let's do this. I hear, though, that the newer games got really detailed in, like, what you could do and all that kind of stuff. We're all happy you're back doing business for us. This mutual arrangement we made to rescue your friend and mentor, Father Vittorio, means you will have to take care of a number of Mafia members residing at the Villa Borghese, where he is kept hostage in the basement. Prime target is Don Giuliani. Security is not exactly lax. Plenty of guards roaming the mansion compound. However, don't expect to free Vittorio just like that. The Don is running a tight ship, and if alarmed, he will probably kill the hostage and escape. They're used to people coming to pay respect, ransoms or bribes, but they are alerted by unusual activities. Check out the map we have of the grounds, Bueno Fortuna 47. Okay. Let's do this. Oh, all right. Loading screen for loading screen. Gotta love it. Come on now. Uh... 
Oh, uh, yeah. Good old PS2 era janky controls. I really should give the newer games in the series a try. Seems like a concept that'd be much better realized on newer hardware. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right. Let me, uh, let me retry that. Come on. Let's do this. Oh, he just left his shit on the floor. Huh. Maybe this will get me through the door. Out of the way, motherfucker. He's carrying groceries, bro. What? I get groceries, bro. Okay. Hey. Stop being an asshole. Ah! I just have groceries, damn it! <laughs> Alright, we're getting out. Silent Scope 3. Silent Scope 3 was a game I played in the arcades a bit. I, was, I didn't really have a lot of interest in playing it on consoles, though, because the a big part of the game was the scope. It's a, a sniper must be unemotional. It was kind of a light gun game in the arcades, but you had this giant uh, sniper rifle. And inside the scope of the sniper rifle was a little CRT screen or something, so you could, you could look through the... You could look through the scope, and that would give you a... <laughs> oh, God. This is... Oh, they hit me from that distance. Wow, these guys are better than I am. My microphone cord fell out, but that game was terrible. It does not capture what the arcade games did. And even if you had, like, a light gun, it still wouldn't, because being able to look through the scope was a big part of what made that game so good. Ratchet and Clank. Oh, man. Insomniac. Another one of the big platformer series of the PlayStation 2. Continues to this day, there was a Ratchet and Clank PS5 game. When we started talking about the ideas behind Ratchet and Clank, this character that rockets from planet to planet with weapons and gadgets, well, weapons suddenly jumped to the foreground. When you get weapons in this game, there's such immediate gratification. You can go out and blow the crap out of everything. 
we knew we had to come up with something that was going to raise the bar even farther than Spyro had as far as actual platformers went. And that's where Ratchet and Clank came from. We're actually expanding the genre. We're trying to break out of what people typically consider the action platformer or character action game genre. One of the big differences between Spyro and Ratchet is being able to animate this stuff on the PS2. And the single level in this game is probably more art than was in an entire game on one of our PS1 releases. Every single level of the game we bring forth something new for the player to do. By the fifth or sixth level of this game, we are up to the complexity of the strongest titles in the category, and there's a lot of levels in this game. There's loads and loads of stuff wherever you look. There's detail, there's movement, explosions. It's a busy world. When someone plays an Insomniac game, they, they can see anywhere they look in the game, there's an attention to detail, quality, as well as technical performance that, that is never lacking. What Insomniac has done with this game blows my mind every time I see it. Like, I just sit in awe and stare at the, at the visual material and just the all-encompassing feel that this game offers. There are a lot of things that the players have to do, a lot of things that players have to keep in mind, but when it comes down to it, it's really just about blowing up. Ratchet and Clank, coming to a galaxy near you. Ratchet and Clank, big deal. And they made a bunch more, a uh, bunch more of those. There was a remake of the original Ratchet and Clank that came out for the PS4 some five or six years ago. Contra Shattered Soldier. That's a video. You know, the only Contra that matters to me is Contra on the NES. And even then, it's like a brutally difficult game. <laughs> Is this a PS1 game? Some games just didn't make a very good transition into the 3D era. Oh, look at that. Definitely looks like Contra. All right, I get it. Whoa, that's an unfortunate ride. Okay. Fall 2002. 
Better keep my eye out for that one. That looks like it's going to be a big deal. Dot hack. You know, I never played Dot Hack, but it was a game I was sort of. I was interested in giving a try back when it was new. Because, I, you know, I was. I wanted to get into the PS2 RPG bandwagon, and it seemed like one that promised. Because the idea behind it was. It was a sort of. It was definitely a single player game, but it was set in the world of an MMORPG. Which was a fairly new concept at the time. <laughs> but I never ended up playing any of the games. There was like, like a an anime show I watched a couple of episodes of. But it was not uh, very good. <laughs> I'm not in the anime though, so maybe I'm just not the person to judge these things. They made a lot of Dot Hack games. I think it was actually the studio that made Dot Hack that that Square eventually Square Enix eventually contracted to make the remake for Final Fantasy VII, but they botched it, so they took over control. <laughs> Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Which which one was this? Pro Skater Four. You know, by this point, I had kind of lost interest in the Tony Hawk games. I think the underground, uh, Tony Hawk's underground games were really what the next generation of what Tony Hawk was supposed to be ended up coming out and taking it to the next level. But I feel like Tony Hawk 4 was more or less just Tony Hawk, but on the next generation. It's one of those 3D environment games that just worked so well on the hardware of the PlayStation 1 that unless you added something new to it, you weren't really going to get anything fantastic out of a jump to the next generation. Just better graphics, you know, a little bit larger environments, stuff like that. They really did need, like, the underground kind of thing to really take it to the next level. Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness. My god, this game sucks. I was never a huge fan of the Tomb Raider games to begin with, but this was supposed to be their big thing, taking, like, again, taking it to the next generation. And they seem like they tried going much more of a story focus in this than they did in the earlier games, more of a personal journey for Lara instead of just um, getting caught up in, in Indiana Jones style. Uh, romp through the jungles and all that. Something about her mentor gets murdered and she's, like, wanted for the crime or something. I don't know. But the gameplay was just so boring. And it was buggy and... It had this weird, like, um, semi-RPG mechanic where Lara would be able to upgrade her strength or something by doing things, but it didn't really work right. It was, was really awkward. I think this was the last game, though, in the... You just brush away broken glass with the back of your hand. <laughs> I think this was actually the last game in the continuity of the original Lara Croft, though. Because it was supposed to be the start of a new series, but it followed the continuity of the earlier games, like Tomb Raider 1, 2, and 3, and all that kind of stuff. Then after this, Tomb Raider sort of went dormant for a few years. And then they came out with, uh... Legend? Was it Legend? 
And Legend, like, oh, well, they called it. They called the character Lara Croft, but she was a different Lara Croft. And then they did a few of those. And then they rebooted again. They rebooted the Tomb Raider series twice. And I think we've been in the reboot Tomb Raider. The reboot of the reboot Tomb Raider series for 10 years now. So it's kind of weird to think about it, though, that the... I guess the, the original Lara Croft lasted until... God, I don't know when the original game came out. 6? 96? So, maybe not. I'm going to call it, say, 1996. And the reboot, like the Legend series, came out with the Xbox 360. So, the 360 came out in 05. So, I guess it was nine years that the original... Wait, no. I don't know when Angel of Darkness... Fuck, I don't know. Why am I bothering to talk about this? This is the original Lara Croft, though. Oh, okay, we're out of demos. Good, because this episode's like an hour long as it is. <laughs> Alright, in the next installment of this, I'll check out everything else on this demo disc.